We are going to move into a, a, a just a series. I just felt in my spirit to just teach uh, and unpack some things that the Bible has to say about family. Uh, I, I look back over my notes over the last 10 years and recognize that I really haven't even taught a series on family for a number of years, and I felt really convicted. Uh, I just God's been dropping some things into my, into my heart and my spirit, and as, I, as we move into the fall, you know, that always leads me into thinking about family. I don't know about you. You know, some of y'all, it leads you into getting your wood and getting your elk. But uh, it always leads into me thinking about family. How many of you, how many of you uh, have like some of the craziest family dinners ever? Like, can, can I just confess something to you? And I know I think I've got my, I think I have my, my, my two sisters watch on live stream, so I'm going to try to be really careful not to throw them under the bus. I says, <laughs> I think my grandma started this, but we used to get together for family dinners, and without, I mean, every single time, it would be like by the end of it, or sometime during it, like Thanksgiving especially, somebody's talking about their latest surgery. I mean, it is crazy. I remember my brother-in-law, when he married into the family, it shocked him because it's like at the table and you're talking about your latest, you know, your latest whatever you went through. Some of the craziest things have happened during our family getting together. I remember one Thanksgiving, my sister, one of my sisters, uh, was making fun of me. I mean, she, can you believe that? She was making fun of me. <laughs> She was making fun of the way that I laugh, you know, and, and, and we were there and she was making fun of the way, she was making fun of the way I laugh. And suddenly she started choking. I mean, seriously, this is a true story. She started choking and I'm like, you know, and she's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. and then she keeps choking and pretty soon she's like, okay, I'm choking. Well, the good thing is I just like done my first aid class. Everybody else in the room was just paralyzed. My mom, all she could do was pray, Jesus, 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 Jesus. My sister's choking. So I basically, you know, do the Heimlich maneuver, you know, and, and it doesn't work the first time. And so she's like, you know, do it again, do it again, poop. You know, here comes the stuffing, right? <laughs> it was perfect timing. You're okay? Yeah. Never mock me again. <laughs> You'll hear me say often that church is family because it is, it's God's family. And it was never meant to be an institution. Church was never meant to be an institution. Uh, it was never described or operated such in the Bible. And, and, and the Bible speaks of family often. And you're going to find out that they're so, it's similar. Some of the parallels are just, it's an uncanny almost when you look at the family unit that God has desired and designed and the church and how the church is supposed to work together. And I'm going to get into that a little bit, but the Bible speaks of family often. In Psalm 96, verse 7, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. In Psalm 107, 41, it says, But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction, and he makes his families, somebody say families, like a flock. And as Jesus is building the church, he's also building family because you can't separate the two. See, if you don't have families that are being built, the church doesn't get built. It, it's, it's amazing. And when you have strong families, you have strong churches. And if we look at uh, the, even God's creation, you know, in the beginning with Adam and Eve, that was the first family. And right away there was problems when Sin was introduced into the world. The first family became the first target. And I might say some things this morning that will challenge you, but, but, but know my heart, I'm, I'm going to challenge you, and I'm especially going to challenge some of our men this morning, so hang on, guys, just buckle up. Because the attack is real, the target is real. Cain, murdering his brother Abel, started right from the beginning, disunity. Dysfunction right from the start. And there may be no more of an intense battle on the earth. A lot of times we think of you know, World War I, World War II, the conflict with North Korea, etc. Et these, these are all conflicts. 
But I don't think there's a more intense battle than when it comes to the family. Because the, the, that's one of the first things that when God created Adam and Eve, He put together family. Historical, biblical accounts show us time and time the battle against family. Our recent history even shows us the battle against family, the challenges. Sometimes it's battles and sometimes it's challenges. You know, I was doing some research on just the industrial age. The industrial age changed forever the, uh, the, 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 the structure of family. You know, where all business and commerce used to be done in, in the home, and now it was basically, you know, out and it started in Europe. And now, now you know, uh, the cities grew and families, I mean, it was just a total change in how the family fabric was there. There's a constant attempt to redefine marriage. Not, a, not just in our nation, but in the world. Uh, I look at even abortion. Abortion is a dream killer. For family. Uh, interesting story. Uh, a professor uh, in a uh, you know, major medical school posed this medical situation, an ethical situation, ethical problem, to his students. So he gives them the family history. He said, here's the family history. He says, the, the, the father has syphilis. The mother has TB. They already have had four children. The first one is blind, and the second one had died. The third one is deaf, and the fourth has TB. Now the mother is pregnant again, and the parents come to you for advice. They are willing to have an abortion. If you decide they should, what do you say? And so the students, they gave their individual opinions, and then the professor asked them to break into some small groups and come back with a consensus and, and, and it basically, the story goes on that all the groups came back to report that they would recommend abortion. The professor said, congratulations, you just took the life of Beethoven. See, there, there, there's a challenge and there's a battle against family, and it's on every front that we, we find. I mean, there's, there's, there's a culture that tries to seep into to your understanding, to my understanding, and it goes against what we know is biblically sound in structure and that God intended from the, from the start. I want to listen to a couple promises, or read a couple promises that God uh, made to Jacob. In Genesis 28, 14, it says, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And the promise that was crazy. The promise that was made to Jacob, it was made to him when he was without family, without provision, without protection, without community. And yet God said, I'm going to change some things in your situation now. See, that's the beauty of how God works. He can take your situation now, and it could be fractured, it could be broken, and he can say, hey, listen, this is maybe where you are, but I've got a promise to where you can be. And that's the promise of God. And because we know the heart of God is for family, then there's something that God wants to bring into our lives by his word and by his spirit that can change the fabric of how we operate. And it spoke to uh, not only Jacob regarding the house of God, but also about blessing the family through his seed. In Galatians 3.16, it clarifies the seed. Galatians 3.16 says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Galatians 3.29 says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise Galatians 4.28 says, Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. So what we find is that Jesus is building the church. And at the same time, Jesus is building family. And Jesus will use the church to build family. He will set the solitary into family. I just had somebody come up to me just a a week or two ago and say, You know, this. I just recognize that this is my family. This is not just some institution, you know, this is not some place where, yeah, I really like the building, I love that youth pastor, I love the worship, but actually this is family. And because of that, I think that God is growing some things. Listen, God wants our families to grow, and he wants his family to grow. In Jeremiah 30, verse 18 through 20, I want to show you kind of a, you know, a 
a link, a pathway between the congregation, a church that God is building, and the family. In Jeremiah 30, verse 18 through 20, it says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob. Remember, he spoke to Jacob. Jacob was alone. Jacob was rejected. Jacob was cast out of his family. God starts speaking into him about family. Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and, and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound and the palace shall stand where it used to be. Out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and voices of those who celebrate. I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will make them honored and they shall not be small. Their children shall be as if they were of old and their congregation shall be established before me and I will punish all those who oppress them. And then in Jeremiah 31, 1, it says, at that time declares the Lord. So we're just, we're just going down a little bit farther. I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. There's something in the heart of God as Jesus is building the church. He also wants the church to be building family. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and, and we know that's a type and a shadow. It's a real event of salvation, but also a type and shadow of salvation to come. But it, not, it just didn't preserve Noah. It preserved Noah's family. And, and it's kind of interesting because if you look at how even the animals were brought into the ark, they were brought in by their family. They were brought in by the, the families. It, it, it's really interesting as you watch this, you can see so many... Uh, similarities in so many points. When a census would be taken of Israel, it would be of the families. There's well over 200 references to family in the Bible. I think that family is important to God. Would you agree? So I want to talk for just a few minutes this morning. Uh, and I, I've entitled this point. I've got like one point, okay? So uh, there may be like 20 subpoints. But there's one point, okay, and, and it's a man to lead, because this really speaks to me, and it's part of the heart beat of, of what I believe that God has, uh, you, you know, in the, in the influence. You may be in a family that's fractured right now. I was raised up that way. I was raised up in a fractured family, and because of the absence of a godly father, my mom had to be strong. Praise God that my mom and my grandma were strong. Uh, all of my mom's kids are believers. They love the Lord. They serve the Lord. And, and despite all of those challenges, she had, to, she had to be strong. And I also know that building family the way that God is designed starts with the head of any household. All the men got really quiet. Come on, guys, you can handle it. Listen, Moses was not allowed to lead Israel out of Egypt until he had his family in order. It's kind of crazy. Here's, here, here, here's you know, a people that have been in slavery for 400 years, and God chooses a man named Moses. And, and there's this really interesting, I love this, this, this exchange right here in Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 through 26. Okay, so you got to understand that God's been working on Moses, and he's going to use Moses to basically bring the children of Israel out of captivity. That sets the stage. It's going to be a great rescue. Probably the greatest rescue outside of the flood that the world's ever seen. Exodus 4, 21 through 26, the Lord said to Moses, when you get back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. So God has already been actually working with Moses and showing him uh, yeah, miracles and signs and you know throw your staff down put your hand inside of your you know your coat and all kinds of stuff just miraculous wonder working power of God right so he's going through all this uh, and then he says but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go then you will say to Pharaoh thus says the Lord Israel is my son my firstborn so I said to you let my son go that he may serve me but you have refused to let him go behold I will uh, I will kill your son and your and your firstborn now, so, so God's downloading this instructions to give Moses as he goes in to just do amazing work. And then in verse 24, we're talking about, here's this dialogue. And then in verse 24, now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. 
I'm like, wow, he just flipped the script. Moses, you're going to be great. You're going to do this. I've showed you all my power. I've filled, I mean, all this. And, and by the way, we, we come to this plate. It's like, okay, now I'm going to kill you. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. But we find the key because if we look at verse um, 25, it says, Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. And so he let him alone. And at that time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. That seems like a really weird thing that just happened right there. I'm going to use you, Moses. This is going to be good. I get to this place. I'm going to kill you. And then his wife basically circumcised their son and threw a pretty yucky thing right at his feet. She saved Moses' life. And you know what the issue was? Is that Moses knew some stuff that he wasn't actually teaching in his family. And God said, that's a no-no, because I'm going to use you to rescue, and i got some great plans for you, but I'm not going to use you outside this. you got to basically be the same in your family as you are outside your family. That's a lot of responsibility, but he was saying, listen, you're teaching some stuff, you're learning some stuff, and you're not actually imparting it to your family, to your son. That's a no-no. You can't do that. I'll go find somebody else. I'll use, I'll use somebody named Sam. But you've got to do this. And his wife saved him. She got it. Probably sometimes my wife has kind of saved me too. By her prayer. It actually talks in Peter about how the, the prayers of a, a believing wife sanctify a husband. Seriously, there was time in my life where, man, I'm glad my wife was praying because I surely didn't see very didn't feel very sanctified but God was going to take the life of Moses his wife saved the day and the issue was that Moses was a man of covenant and relationship with God and not brought and led his family into that relationship Eli Eli lost his priesthood because of his failure at home first Samuel 3 12 through 13 it says in that day I will carry against Carry out against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, but because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Wait a minute, man. I thought the Bible was like all really full of warm and fuzzy and awesome stuff all the time. Listen, there's God disciplines us. And he'll challenge us. God challenges me by his word. This challenges me. How about Samuel? Look at Samuel. Here's a great prophet. Learn how to hear the voice of the Lord from an early age. Israel pressured Samuel for a king, and it was a result of Samuel's failure to be a prophet in his own home. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But if you look at 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 5, and it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. And now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest game, took bribes, and perverted justice. And then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and listen to this, and they said to them, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations." I'm like, super convicted right now, Lord. Abraham. God knew he could trust Abraham because of his faithfulness to his family. It says in Genesis 18, 19, For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now, this is, this is really interesting because different translations in Genesis 18, 19, when it says, for I've chosen him, there's different translations of that word that will use uh, chosen, known, settled. For I've known him, one translation says. Another says, for I've settled on him. It means that God actually uh, made a move towards Abraham. And, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit. 
but that knowing God changes a man. When God chooses you, he changes you. And my, my personal journey is that when I changed as a man, it affected my family. When, uh, when I was healed and restored, it affected the atmosphere. When the things of God became important to me, they became important to my family. I recognized that I needed to lead. When I led, in, when I led in, a, in a godly way, my family prospered. When I gave, my family gave. When I repented, my family learned how to repent. I mean, one of the greatest things that I think that I did with my kids, I think I did some pretty good stuff with my kids, and I think I, I made some mistakes with my kids, but one of the things that I did that God just impressed me on early was just being able to go to my sons and just be able to say, son, would you forgive me? I really messed up here, and I want to repent. I never want to do that again. And what did that do is it showed them that that's okay to do. How, how many of you ever grew up with somebody that never, ever said they were sorry? Never. Never. But so when I, when, where I led, my family would go. Uh, when the things of God became important to me, they became important to my family. If the things of God weren't important to me, they weren't important to my family. Because I set the tone. A man changes the atmosphere when he walks into the room. We carry something that God has put in us. And there's an atmosphere, there's an influence that we have to shepherd, we have to steward. David, even David, a man called after God's own heart, didn't bring all of his children into the faith, the kind of love and worship that, that, that he experienced with God. And they suffered before it. You know, I, I prayed, I, I actually even got up really early this morning I mean, we got up at like 4.30, and I said, God, how can I make this a little bit more gentle? How can I kind of take some edge off this? Can, God, is there another message maybe that I could preach? You know, I'd, I'd love to preach on, I don't know, anything. But I knew that this right here is like, oh, man, because I love the men in our church. And so many of you, you do such a great job. I just want to commend you. I've seen it when you're healed and something happens in your family. I've seen God restore you and things change in your family. I've seen where the things of God become important to you. And guess what? Your family is there with you. Amen. I'm proud of you. But I believe that building strong men leads to strong families. And strong families lead to strong churches. And strong churches basically impact a community. There, there, there's something about this that... I, I, it, it's, it's probably why I spent so much time praying and, and, and seeking and, and vision. When I, be, when I became a man of worship, my, my, my family became a family of worship. When my son saw that I was willing to worship and kind of get beyond, listen, I, by nature, I'm a pretty conservative, stoic person. You know why I don't like to laugh? Because I look funny when I laugh. So my Swedish stoic nature just kind of, you know, says it, and I'm laughing inside. But when I, when I, when I stepped out of my kind of conservative thing, because I realized it was important for me to model what worship looked like to my sons. It wasn't like, oh, okay, 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 son, hey, listen, uh, uh, I'm having good thoughts about the Lord here. Just want to let you know. They needed to see me model something. They needed to see me model something. And they became worshipers. You know, in fact, when I watch my sons now, it's like, oh, man, they put me to shame sometimes. They just worship. It's so amazing. But it had to start with me. It had to start with me. It has to start with us, man. It has to start with us. When I became a man of prayer, my family, my sons understood what prayer was because they saw it modeled. See, when God chose me, when God chose, when God chose you, He healed you. He restored you. You are on a, a, a process of recovery. And that recovery basically affects everything around you. You walk into your place of business, that recovery should affect it. Because you're walking in more of a man than what you were before. See, what the world does is it, it, it basically defiles us, it breaks us, it fractures us. We don't think the way that we're supposed to think. And God, it's just like David in the cave of Abdullam. 
I mean, David was, was at the bottom of the bottom, and the, and the Bible says that he had 400 men who were indebted, distressed, discouraged. 400 of them. But then David had a revelation of the goodness of God and began to worship God. And those 400 men became the 400 mighty men of David that we teach about, preach about, read about thousands of years afterwards. Why? Because the head, that one man, decided that I was going to uh, present myself to the Lord, surrender to God, and be changed. And when you do that, then God begins to work. He, he begins to add some things to you. When God spoke to me about misplaced priorities, it brought my family back into alignment. When God spoke to me about being an angry man, it changed how my wife and my children looked and related to me. I thought, you can't be an angry man. I want to be an angry man. I have every right to be an angry man. You, I mean, my life was messed up. So you can't be an angry man. Be angry. Don't sin. You've got to help me, God, because I don't know how to not be angry. And probably, much like a lot of you, you've had, you've had terrible, just fractured, evil stuff that you've walked through. So there's something in you that just gets all tied up and frustrated. And you don't know how to express it. And you don't know how to, how do I deal with this brokenness? It's easy. Surrender. Surrender. The process isn't easy, but the first step to the process is easy. Surrender. New Testament leadership places a high priority on the leadership at home. Look at this. Speaking of an elder, it's the same for a deacon. 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5, qualifications. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Dang, that was, a, that was a thing for me. I could keep my children under control, but I don't think I did it with dignity. I did it with son. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Son, I'd even use a Bible on him. Don't make me lay hands on you suddenly. I didn't do it with dignity. And God had to really do some things in my heart. Because you know what he wants to do with you? He wants to turn us. Paul said this. He said, you have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. And you know what the world needs? The world needs real spiritual fathering. And it starts with surrender. And it starts with your family. It says, but if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Titus 1 6, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion. And it's the reason why I place a great amount of prayer, a great amount of thought and virtue in reaching out to men. I want to create an atmosphere of growth, of challenge, and of equipping. And I want to come at it from a place that, like, I haven't arrived. God's still working on me. I mean, every time I talk to God, I just, okay, God, show me another layer. Show me that one thing. Show me, don't show them all, Lord. He might frighten me. I, seriously, don't show me all this stuff, God. I already kind of know it, but show me what you want me to do. Help me to change. See, I know that it may be difficult. It might be a difficult challenge for our men. But I'm telling you what, the danger is real. The attack is tragic. We see it all over. The, the redefinition of family, redefinition of marriage. I mean, it, it, it's insane. And it's evil what's happening in the world. And God has the answer because as Jesus is building the church, he's also building family. Amen. I said this about six, seven years ago. Drop, God dropped it in my heart. You know, our, our, you know God's family, uh, your family, our family. That's really what I just feel like God is saying and doing in this season. There's something about it. Now, here's the amazing part. Because you, much like me, may feel really inadequate in your walk and in your leadership. If you were uh, like me, and I, I, I know, I know some, some of the guy's story, I, you, you didn't have a mentor, you didn't have a model, you didn't even know what it was supposed to look like. I didn't even know what it was supposed to look like. 
You know, I thought I was a great husband just because I could go out and make money and, you know, make sure that there was bread on the table. That's all, I'm, that's all required, right? It's not. There's so much more. I felt so inadequate because I had never had it mentored. I never had it modeled to me. But the translation concerning Abraham and God's relationship uses the word known, for I have known him. That just exploded in my spirit because that word known him, I've known it speaks of intimacy and speaks of relationship. For I have known him. And see, when God knows you, then there's this pathway of change. There's a blessing that begins to come. There might be a lot of issues that overwhelm you and you're not sure how you can fix or repair, but God is a builder. And, and maybe you're here this morning and said, I just feel stuck. I feel stunted in, my, in, in what I'm doing. But listen, I love this. The Bible says that Jesus is he's the author and finisher of our faith. That means what he starts, he finishes. Yeah. And so, you know, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. How many of you would say, okay, maybe I'm not arrived, because I'm going to raise my hand. I'm not arrived, but God did start something in me. I know he started something in me. Well, then have faith that as he knows you, that he will complete the work in you, and there will be something. God will drop stuff into your spirit and your heart. It's like, man, I just can't get along with my wife right now. Then pray, ask God how to approach her. Start doing some practical things that are basically dropped down from heavenly wisdom. I'm not sure how I can really... Talk to my son. My son and I were at odds. It's like, Jesus, I just need to know. He just is not listening to me. You know what God spoke to me? You're not listening to him. Yeah, but I'm the dad. No. God drops stuff into me. God will drop some things into your spirit and help you with some of these things. Can I have a, can I have a musician this morning? I, I just want you to know, I knew this, to me, this is challenging. Now, I say this, and then Rob like, oh, no, honey, it was great, it was fine. But I mean, to me, my spirit is like, oh, God, I want to see the man. I want to see the man in our church rise up. touch their hearts God this is about family and it's about your family it's about their family it's about our family and I know there's a lot of fractures and there's a lot of there's a lot of diversions and there's a lot of distractions God I can be a distracted man I can let good things keep me from doing great things but all I know is my heart There's families that need godly men leading them, showing them, mentoring them, worshiping, praying, giving, being unselfish, serving. It's the only difference that I know in the earth. It'll make a difference. Oh, you can do it. I know it's in you. I know it's in you. I didn't plan this at all. You can't plan this. one of those kids that wasn't raised up with a godly father. I don't want to see our children raised up without godly men. You got it in you. 
You have it in you. It's in you. And it's in you because God will know you if you'll know him.